face at least two dangers we face when we pray. The first one is that we might be too worried about what others think about our prayers. Of course, this would be in the context of praying with other people in a home group or Bible study or maybe with your family. The first danger we face is we're too concerned how we sound to others and do they approve of our, of our prayers. The second danger we face is wordy jargon that has no content, right? Wordiness, Christianese, uh, kind of a Christian jargon and a, and a rote kind of prayer life that just really has no, no biblical content. We could summarize these two dangers then in two words. Uh, we are worried and wordy. <laughs> and the solution is biblical brevity to an audience of one. Biblical brevity to an audience of one. And there's the entire sermon. We could close in prayer. <laughs> That's it. We're going to deal with those two problems, worried about what others think in wordiness, with one solution, biblical brevity, to an audience of one. Well, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, where we find this solution. And let me show you uh, where it comes from. Matthew chapter 6 is where we find ourselves these days in our church as we go through the Gospel of Matthew. This is the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And last week, if you were here, we looked at 6, 1 to 18, except we set aside 7 to 15, if you'll remember. And last week, we looked at these three examples that Jesus uh, gives here in practicing uh, secret righteousness. And he talked about the example of giving to the poor, the example of prayer, and then the example of fasting. And so we looked at those last week in, in total. But I told you we were setting aside 7 to 15 because it has its own unique message, really. And this is because in this section of Matthew 6, 1 to 18, there is an emphasis here. There is a stress being laid here on a particular Example on a particular topic, and it's not giving and it's not fasting, it's what? Prayer. There is a tremendous amount of emphasis here in this text on prayer. Let me show you what I mean. If you're looking at 6 1 to 18, Jesus' words about prayer make up half of this passage. It is also the middle example of the three drawing attention to it. He includes in this example, unlike the example on giving or fasting, he includes the example of prayer. Here is a model. He doesn't give us a model for giving or a model for fasting, but he does for prayer. And finally, it breaks the pattern. There is a clear pattern in 1 to 6 and 6 to 18, but this section breaks the pattern. And so it causes us to say there is something different and special about this section. Now, it's even further than that. This is essentially the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount is what's been called the Lord's Prayer. And so some would argue that this is the central, most emphasized part of this entire three-chapter sermon. And so today we want to go back to the passage we set aside last week and focus on it. And in fact, I'm going to expand it a little bit. We're going to back up into verse 5 so that we have the entire passage then that is on the subject of prayer. You'll notice in verse 5, he says, when you pray. And so we'll cover that through verse 15 this morning. In this passage, Jesus contrasts then meaningless prayer with meaning full prayer, prayer that is full of meaning. He doesn't just do this for our intellectual curiosity. He doesn't just do this because it's a fascinating topic or something relevant to most people everywhere. No, what he is doing here as our king and as our teacher is he is teaching us how to pray and how not to pray. This is a critical section then as we learn from the master. Here is the greatest teacher on prayer ever. Here is the greatest prayer warrior ever. Now we get to sit at his feet and learn from him how to pray and how not to pray. And that's the purpose of this sermon is that all of us leave here today better equipped to pray as disciples, having learned from Jesus himself. 
And I know that none of us who are believers in Christ want to pray meaningless prayers. We long for our prayers to be effective. We long for our prayers to be fresh and powerful and, 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 and moving in our own hearts. We long to pray with more faith, right? We long to pray more biblical prayers. And so today we get to learn how to do all of those things. Now we begin with the negative in this contrast. We begin with the meaningless prayer of pretenders. I'm calling it the meaningless prayer of pretenders. And it has two components to it. The meaningless prayer of pretenders begins this way. It has got the wrong motive. It begins as a prayer for public consumption. You can move on with the slides. It begins with the prayer for public consumption. Look at verse 5. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Seen and heard, of course. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. Last week, we unpacked all that that meant. We just draw your attention to it briefly this morning. The meaningless prayer of pretenders is for public consumption. Grant Osborne in his commentary on Matthew, had this to say, very arresting words. He said, to misuse the vertical love relationship with our Lord as a horizontal showcase to impress others is an abomination. I want to say that again. To misuse the vertical love relationship with our Lord as a horizontal showcase to impress others is an abomination. And that's what's going on in verse 5. This precious gift of prayer that God has given us as believers as a way for us to express our love and thanks and gratitude to God, as a way for us to, to experience Him and our love relationship with Him can be turned into nothing more than a showcase to impress other people. And he says this is one of the greatest sins that there could be. This is an abomination before God that He would give such a gift and it would be so perverted. And so that's certainly a way for us to pray meaningless prayers. More worried about how we sound to others and whether they approve or not is going to take us there very quickly, isn't it? Now, the second thing we learn about the meaningless prayer of pretenders is that they pray with verbosity or verbosity. They're very ver verbose. It's lots of words. It's lots of verbiage. Look at verses 7 and 8. When you are praying... Do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, as the pagans do, as the ethnicities do. Don't do it, he says, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, verse 8, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. And so the meaningless prayer pretenders is filled with meaningless repetition, verse 7. This, this word, meaningless repetition, is literally the word stutter. It's to stammer. It's to babble. It's to blah, 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 blah in our prayers. Just repeating the same tired, worn out, trite phrases over and over and over again. He says, don't do that. That's the, way, that's the way unbelievers pray. That's the way Gentiles pray as he addresses his Jewish audience. In his day, the Gentiles would use chants in their prayer. They would, they would repeat over and over incoherent syllables of gibberish as they would pray to this God of rain over here and this God of war over here and this God of fertility over here. This is how the Gentiles would pray. They had gods for everything and they piled up their words to each God to try to get that God's blessing. They would try to manipulate that God. They would try to coerce that God to give them more cows or more chickens or more rainfall and crops. It was all couched in superstition and false religion and idolatry because these were not real gods of course they were deaf and they were blind and they were helpless to answer these prayers and so given the fact that they're unbelievers given that these Gentiles are praying from a foundation of doubt to begin with they have to constantly pile on the words trying to be heard they hope to be heard for their many words they were just like the prophets of Baal. They're on Mount Carmel, 
praying and cutting themselves and crying out to their gods all day. And then you get the contrast of Elijah with a short, direct, specific prayer to the one true God and he answers, <laughs> right? What a contrast that is between true prayer and meaningless prayer. But it's interesting. Jesus points out Gentiles here in verse seven, the nations. But you know what? The Jews could fall into this same trap. This was a snare anyone could fall into. In fact, it was well known among Jews and among Pharisees that they would slip into a rote religion. They, they would slip into a kind of religion that wasn't from the heart, right? Jesus would even say this later. You honor me with what? Your lips, but your heart is far from me because their prayers and their service and their words weren't from the heart. In fact, did you know the Jews of Jesus' day, they had 18 18 benedictions that they would say two to three times a day. These, these formulas of blessed be to God. And in and of themselves, they're, they're great. Many of them came from the Psalms, but they had these 18 and they had to say all 18 of them two to three times a day. And so it just became meaningless, what? Repetition. Now look at this in verse seven and eight. Jesus is acknowledging what the Gentiles are doing. They're praying to these idols, right? And he says in verse 8 to his disciples, do not be like them. Don't even resemble them. Don't even get close to them. Why not? For your father. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. These idols, they don't know what they need before they ask. These idols are dumb and stupid. But your father, singular, your father is real and your father hears and your father knows. You can't inform God. So one of our first lessons here in prayer by way of contrast is if you're informing God in your prayers, just stop it. <laughs> you want some biblical counseling this morning? Stop it, all right? God does not need to be educated by our prayers. God does not need to be taught, counseled, or informed. Jesus is saying this here. We're not praying to an idol. We're not praying to something with no ears and no eyes and no knowledge. We're praying to our Father who knows us and knows what we need before we ask him. He knows what we're going to say before we say it. He knows why we're going to say it. He knows how we're going to say it. He knows where we're going to say it. Not a word comes out of our mouth that he doesn't altogether know it beforehand. And so we can inform him. We just simply make our direct request of him. So this is then the meaningless prayer of pretenders and unbelievers. It is for public consumption often and it is with verbosity. Now, we need to apply this. We need to ask this question. What are today's examples of meaningless repetition? What are the ways that this is going on in our day and age? Well, there's a couple of really low-hanging fruit here I'm gonna just uh, take advantage of. Just obvious. I'm not trying to be offensive, but they're so obvious they have to be stated. As we look to the Word of God to teach, to correct, to reprove, and to train in righteousness. The first and most obvious is the rosary. The rosary is a, a prayer using a, a necklace of beads so that you can actually keep up with where you are in the system because it is so complex and intricate. Uh, the rosary, I did some research on it this week, learned more about it than I've ever known. It has 10 stages. There are 10 stages to the rosary and in those 10 stages, the prayer will pray 14 Hail Marys. Now, I didn't even know what that meant. I read that. Uh, a Hail Mary, it's actually an entire paragraph. It's not just saying, Hail Mary. It's not just saying, oh, Mary this or that. It's an entire paragraph. And so in the rosary, if you complete all 10 stages, you're saying 14 of these paragraphs. It has at least six Our Fathers in it. That's their description of what's commonly called the Lord's Prayer. A better term for it would be the Disciples' Prayer. It has six of those. It includes the Apostles' Creed. Several other uh, doxologies are mixed in. Uh, and, you, and you go through this and includes these mysteries, these four mysteries that you must uh, acknowledge and, and work through. And, and certainly that is an example of, of meaningless repetition. Here's another one, low-hanging fruit indeed. I, I would call it the gibberish of tongues. The so-called prayer language that is so popular among so many. 
uh, private prayer language that some have adopted and it's really gibberish. It's nonsensical syllables strung together. It's learned behavior. It's not biblical. It's not taught in the Bible. It's not encouraged in the Bible. In fact, I believe this verse right here is actually condemning it. I believe verse seven is actually speaking to exactly that issue. It is so close to what the Gentiles were doing of Jesus' day, it's scary. It really begins to look very similar to the mantras that go on in Eastern religions where God is denied completely. I'm talking Buddhism and Confucianism and these kind of things in Eastern religions where they get into a trance-like state by restating these mantras over and over again. And so this is not only probably clearly unbiblical, it's perhaps dangerous. And the Bible does not support it and the Bible does not encourage it. I think this is some, another clear example of what Jesus is here teaching us not to do. He says, they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, verse eight. Now let's get a little closer to home perhaps. Certainly closer to home in my life. Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. That is meaningless repetition. It's not even a good prayer. It's not even biblical. It's not even remotely clear on the gospel. I, need to, I don't need to pray every night worried if God's going to take my soul or not if I die. Right? Where, where's the assurance of salvation in that prayer? And I understand we need to teach children. They need to memorize certain things. I understand that. But uh, let's, let's move on from that one. Here's another one I've been guilty of. Bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies and our bodies to your service. Rote religion, falling into meaningless repetition. We can just say it like a parrot. We can just voice these things out. We're not even thinking about what we're saying. It's so easy for us to fall into these traps. Essentially what Jesus would hear, I think if we want to apply this to our lives, would be just praying the same things and the same words and the same ways over and over and over and over again. Now, I'll be the first to raise my hand that that is a great challenge to resist. And if you're a praying person and the needs are generally the same day after day and the people in your life you're praying for the same day after day, it is very challenging indeed to have fresh words and fresh prayers. I totally get it. I've been praying for real for over 30 years. I get it. But we need to challenge ourselves and we need to use the word of God to dislodge ourselves from these rote, dead, meaningless, repetitionist prayers. You know, the most ironic example of all, the most ironic example of all is this prayer. The Lord's Prayer, prayed before many a Gentile football team before they leave the locker room. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, of course, but it's so ironic that as Jesus says, don't fall into meaningless repetition, the world has fallen into meaningless repetition with the very prayer that he gives us. And we want to make sure we don't do that. All right, so that's the negative. That's the downside of this contrast in this lesson and learning how to, how to pray. We first need to learn how not to pray. Now let's switch to the positive. Let's move over to the how do we pray then. Let's look at the other side of this and meaningful prayer. No longer the pretender and the unbeliever, but meaningful prayer of his followers, of his disciples. Well, in contrast to for public consumption, we begin with it's for an audience of one. It's for an audience of one. So look at verse six. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He will hear, he will answer, he will literally pay you back. Secret prayer to a secret father who hears and sees what's done in secret. We talked about this last week. It's literally going into your pantry. All right? It's going into your inner closet, closing the door, hiding from everyone else, praying to your Father in heaven. We also said last week this doesn't eliminate public prayers. Uh, we, we, it doesn't. We, that'd be going too far. It, it's a way to say, what is my motive when I pray to God? And so the motive should be for an audience of one. 
But then secondly, this meaningful prayer of his followers is with what I'm calling biblical brevity. Biblical brevity. Look at it with me, verses 9 to 15. Pray then in this way. He doesn't just say pray then and gives us the words. He says pray then in this way, in this method, use this pattern, use this model, use this outline. That's what he means. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What is your first impression of that model prayer? It ought to be that it is short. <laughs> it is short and simple, short and sweet. This is biblical brevity like none other. There's an economy of words here. There's a power of words here. There's not a throwaway word. There's not a wasted word. It is an amazing, an amazing model of prayer. Now, we could pick this prayer apart. We could parse every verb and, and, and dive into every detail and go word by word. And I think if we did that, we would miss the whole point of this prayer. This thing could be six sermons easily. And I think if we did that, sure, we'd gain from it, we'd learn from it, but we would miss the point of this model. This is a 15-second prayer. As one commentator said, it's not about length, but strength. Just say that to yourself when you're getting ready to pray. It's not about length, but strength. And there's some strength right here in these words. Commentator Don Hagner put it this way. He said, in prayer, the disciple does not try to coerce or manipulate God. That's what Gentiles do. That's what pagans do. That's not what disciples do. He says, there are no magical words or formula, nor does an abundance of words count with God. Short, direct, and sincere prayers are adequate. I'll go further than saying adequate. They are powerful. They are effective. They are meaningful. Short, direct, and sincere prayers. Now, this doesn't mean you can't pray for a long time. But that long time of prayer ought to be made up of a, a series of short, direct, and meaningful prayer requests. And we don't belabor the point. We don't go on and on and on and on. Blah, 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 blah. Move on. Get to the next thing. I mean, can you imagine God up there just going, I got it, okay? Move to the next thing, right? So we can have long prayers. Jesus did. And, and certainly if we're in private, uh, there, there's nothing wrong with praying for a season and an hour of prayer because prayer can cover so much ground, right? There's so many things that fall under the umbrella of prayer. The point is not to belabor individual aspects of prayer. So Jesus says here very emphatically to his disciples, you, you command, pray, therefore, in this way. Now let me give you some basic observations before we really take it phrase by phrase this morning and look at it closely. Let me give you some basic observations about this model prayer. And that's the first one. It's a model it's a blueprint. You can even think of it as an outline. So we can take each category and, and let it launch us into extended prayer in that category. We'll do that, talk about that more later. Another observation of this prayer, as you look at it there beginning verse 9, is it is first focused on God and then on us. The pattern of this prayer is God first and then me, my needs, our needs, right? And lo and behold, this actually follows the pattern of the Ten Commandments. Uh, so the Ten Commandments have an influence on this prayer model in that the first three commandments, the first four commandments are focused on our relationship with God and the next six on our relationship with each other. Here's another observation this prayer is filled it is literally filled with pointed direct and bold requests in the Greek grammar they're actually commands they're imperatives which is common in the Bible for prayers that's how bold and how direct our prayer requests can be not that we can command God to do whatever we want but it has that flavor of directness to it 
And so if you look at it with me just for a moment, I'll show you the commands here. Hallowed be is one. Your kingdom come, will be done. Give, verse 11. Forgive, verse 12. Do not lead, verse 13. Deliver, verse 13. So it is a prayer made up of then urgent requests. Here's another observation, very important. It is corporate in nature, isn't it? It is familial. It is our Father, not what? My Father. There is our and us and we. There is not my, me, or I. Someone as well said, there's no I in team. Well, there's no I in the Lord's Prayer either. It is corporate in nature. This is the prayer of the family. This is the prayer of the church. This is our prayer that we pray for ourselves and each other because we're not islands unto ourselves. We're not lone rangers. We're not living the Christian life by ourselves. We are living it together. And so we think of our lives in this context. We're in community. We're in the body of Christ, our Father who is in heaven, you see. Another critical observation, this prayer has four categories. I'll give them to you later, but it has four categories. 75% of them are spiritual. 25% of them are physical. It is a pattern Three quarters of this prayer is spiritually related, one quarter physically related. We can go further. This prayer has six requests. It has six requests and only one of them is physical. Uh, that's 17%, I think. One out of six physical, five out of six spiritual. So those are just some basic observations. We learn a lot from those. But let's look at it a little bit now, uh, line by line for a moment, just as we learn how this is a pattern of prayer for us. He begins, our Father who is in heaven. In verses 1 to 18, Jesus has mentioned the Father in total 10 times. Nine of them, your Father, your Father, your Father. This is the only time he says our Father. And he does that for emphasis and he does that for impact and he does that for shock. And this is an amazing statement. It's, it's so much further than we're his children as his disciples and he's our Father. What Jesus is saying is we share the same Father that Jesus Christ has. He has now included himself in the discourse and he begins this prayer, our father, he's my father, he's your father. We share the same father as our Lord Jesus Christ, as the son of God, as our elder brother. <laughs> he shares with us God as father, even though he himself fully God. What an amazing thing this is. We can be in an intimate relationship with the one Jesus Christ is in intimate relationship with, with the one Christ came to reveal, came to put on display. And so as he begins his prayer, our Father, it does speak of our relationship with God. It does speak of, of the fact that he cares for us. He's our provider, our protector. It, it speaks of an intimacy. It speaks of we're his children, he's our Father. It speaks of... Um, I have, I have something here with God. We have something here with God that is special and precious and, and, and the rest of the world doesn't have that's not in Christ. And, and so this Our Father really, in a sense, humanizes God for us. And of course, if you had a, had a wretched, terrible, earthly father, it's really hard to feel this and this intimacy and this specialness. But it, but it in a sense, humanizes God and, it, and it's a special, it's words that remind us of God's imminence, that God is near to us, God is with us as a human father would be with us and, 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 and expressing that care and love and provision. And yet, he quickly balances that, doesn't he? He quickly balances God's imminence with God's what? Transcendence. Our Father, yes, who is in heaven, 
Where is heaven? I don't know. It's really far away. It's transcendent. It's way, way, way out there. He's way up there. He is the most high God. He is the almighty, sovereign God. He rules over heaven. He reigns over heaven. He is the creator God. And so as I begin prayer, I recognize my God is in heaven and I'm on earth. I am a creature. I am dependent. He is exalted. He is high. He is glorious. He is holy. He is in heaven above and I'm stuck here on earth beneath our Father who is in heaven. And so it, has this, it strikes this perfect balance between familiarity and deep awe and respect. I can call him a father, Abba, Papa, Daddy, but it's not just Daddy down the hall. It's Daddy up in heaven. So far beyond me, so much more holier and greater and infinitely glorious than anything I know in this life. Our Father who is in heaven. And that just, just that phrase just captures, really it captures what the whole Bible teaches us about God in a simple economy of words. Father is not new in the New Testament. It's not new with Jesus. This is a concept that goes back to the Old Testament as Israel looked to Yahweh as their father. That's the opening address then. Direct, simple, to the point. One God, our Father in heaven. <clears throat> the next phrase, and this is so misunderstood. You're gonna learn something right here. <laughs> I certainly did. May, it's literally, may your name be hallowed. May your name be hallowed. For you Greek folks out here that love the Greek grammar, this is an aorist passive imperative. It is a command, meaning we're asking, uh, we're, we're directing God to do this, but it's passive, meaning we have nothing to do with it. God must do it. And what it means is he's saying, God, set apart your name. God, vindicate your name, right? God, honor your name, hallowed. So listen carefully. This is not a statement that God's name is hallowed. This is a bold request that it would be. This is a bold request that God would take it upon himself to make his holy name known throughout the entire planet. Right? This is a prayer recognizing things aren't what they should be. The world is not as it ought to be. There is sin. There is defiance. There is rebellion everywhere. There are people living in sin and unholiness everywhere. This is a prayer that God would change all of that. That he would take his character and in a sense enforce it upon the entire planet. God, will you manifest your holiness all over the earth? That's what this is asking. This is what this request means. Set apart your name, O oh God, because it's currently not as it ought to be. The next phrase, verse 10, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come, it's yours. You're the king, you're gonna send the king back. And we're asking you, God, that that would happen because the kingdom hasn't come as Jesus speaks these words. Even though he's present, the kingdom isn't present in its fullness. And so the prayer here for those disciples and, and, and us today, it hadn't stopped. It, we're still praying this because the kingdom hasn't come yet. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now that last phrase on earth as it, as it is in heaven, it actually applies to all three statements. Okay, this is, this is critical. Hallowed be your name on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So right now in heaven, <laughs> and God is reigning. Does he reign over the earth? Yes. But does it look the same? No. Because in heaven right now, everyone instantly and fully and completely obeys God. His will is done perfectly and instantly in heaven. But is his will, is his prescribed will, his revealed will, is it done on earth? Is it done on earth? No, hardly at all. In fact, you look around the earth and it's mostly not done, isn't it? And so that's what this prayer is. It's saying, Father, who reigns in heaven, sovereign God of, of the universe, Make your name holy throughout the earth. Bring your kingdom to planet earth so that your will is done here as it's being done right now in your presence. That's what this is asking for. 
It's a prayer recognizing the fallenness of the world and the curse that is on the world and the sin that's everywhere and the train wreck that we live in every day. It's recognizing that and saying, oh God, things are not as they should be. They're not what they ought to be. They're not what they're going to be. I'm praying that what is to come will be moved into the present. <laughs> that the kingdom would come here and now. This is a prayer to end the world as we know it. It's nothing short of that. We're saying, God, end this world as we know it. Send the king. Bring the Lord Jesus back. That's what this prayer is. Send your son to conquer this world. Send your son to take over this world. Send your son to get what is rightfully his, to do what Adam failed to do, to do what Israel failed to do, to do what David failed to do. Give this world back to Christ. That is what the Lord's Prayer is mostly about. This is the Godward direction of this prayer. God vindicate your name and send your son. This is an echo then of Ezekiel 36, if you'll go there with me. Ezekiel 36 is the backdrop of the Lord's Prayer. And we'll pick it up in verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I'm in Ezekiel 36, verse 22. Thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, for my hallowed name, for my sanctified name, which you, Israel, have profaned among the nations where you went. See, they sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned, and so God finally scattered them to the winds, sent them into exile. And that's where they are to this day. Verse 23, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. You see it? <laughs> this is the backdrop of the Lord's Prayer. For I will take you, Israel, from the nations and gather you from all the lands and I will bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. This is to the promise to the remnant of Israel that will be saved at the return of Christ. I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so you will be my people and I will be your God. This day that we are praying for is nothing short of the fulfillment of the new covenant that is now only partially fulfilled in the church. Verse 29, moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness and I will call for the grain, that's literal grain, and multiply it. And I will not bring a famine on you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field so that you will not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. So great prosperity, great fruitfulness of the land. Verse 31, then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good and the kindness of God leading them to repentance. And you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places to be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolation in the sight of everyone who passes by. They will say, this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left round about you will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. Thus says the Lord God. This also I will let, this also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them. I will increase their men like a flock, like the flock for sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed feast. So will the waste cities be filled with flocks of men. Then they will know 
that I am the Lord. This is the backdrop of the Lord's Prayer. Why should we pray this on a regular basis with faith and from the heart? Because this is what the kingdom will be like. It just blows my mind that people, many well-meaning Christians, think that the kingdom is already present. Blows my mind. Here's what it will be like. The love of God will be normal. It'll be commonplace. Everyone will know and love the Lord, our God. Satan and demons will be serving their 1,000 year prison sentence in a pit. And they're going to the prison called the pit. <laughs> Israel, as I just read, will be finally repentant, physically saved, spiritually saved, renewed, repentant. They will recognize Jesus as their Messiah. Gentiles from all over the world will flood into Jerusalem. They'll get there any way they can. They'll walk, they'll ride a boat, they'll drive a plane. However they can get there, they'll get to Jerusalem because they want to hear the words of King Jesus. They want to sit at his feet as he is in that temple, prophet, priest, and king, giving out his word. They will bring their wealth into Jerusalem. They'll bring their offerings there. And it'll be a day where swords are turned into plows and guns into combines. There will be so much production that famine will be absolutely eradicated throughout the entire planet. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar in all it contains. Let the field exult in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and his peoples in faithfulness. That's Psalm 96. Many, many psalms are actually describing the millennial kingdom. And that one is no exception. That's what the first half of this prayer is all about. And then I like to do this when I'm using this prayer. I like to insert these words right here between verse 10 and verse 11. But in the meantime. But in the meantime, give us our food sufficient for today. So the prayer shifts beginning in verse 11 to our needs and our day right now. And it's literally, it's a one-time use in all the Bible. It's a, it's a word that means sufficient for today. Give us this day our daily bread, our daily food. Now this is not a gimme, gimme, gimme kind of prayer. This is God, I am taking one day at a time and God, I am depending on you for everything. I depend on you for everything. Every bite of food, every drink of water, every stitch of clothing, every, every dollar that I get paid at work, every moment of, of existence, I'm depending on you. This is a complete reliance on God for all the physical needs of our life. Give us this day our daily bread. And then... After this one and only request for the physical, it shifts to the spiritual. In the meantime, not only do we need to live, not only are we depend on you as our Father, it's going to come from your hand. Every good gift comes from above and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. It's going to come from you. We're just here to receive from you. And then these spiritual needs. Forgive us of our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So the prayer moves then from I'm relying on you God for everything to confession of sin, right? Confession of sin. Personal sins, private sins. And I confess these sins in an attitude of willingness to forgive others, right? So look at verse, look at verse 12. Verse 12, you could just stamp integrity on verse 12. Pattern of prayer. I gotta pray with integrity. I can't be coming to God asking him to forgive me of my sins and I'm not willing to forgive someone else. There's no integrity in that. There's no honesty in that. There's no realness in that, right? So that's what this is all about. This is about an attitude. I'm gonna ask God to forgive me of my debts against him, my moral debts. I've sinned against him. I've transgressed his law and I need forgiveness. And so our prayer should have confession of sins, but I can't do this unless I'm willing to say as we also have forgiven our debtors. Don't ask God to do for you what you're not willing to do for someone else. There's no integrity in that. 
ask God to give you the grace to forgive others just as he has forgiven you. He goes on and he says really one thing in two phrases. Do not lead or carry us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, literally. It's rescue us from the devil is what he's saying. Save us, God. <laughs> Save us from Satan. That's what he's saying in verse 13. Not that God would ever tempt us. He doesn't do that, right? So this is a way of saying, God, I know there is a hungry devil. I know he's on the prowl. I know I am no match for him, God. And so I'm asking you by your providence and by your sovereignty to steer me away from his temptations. Just lead me in the opposite directions because I am weak and I am susceptible to fall. And God, I'm crying out to you. I need your rescue. This enemy is real. This is, a, this is how we fight wise spiritual warfare. So category, confession of sin. Category, spiritual warfare. And I'm gonna fight it wisely with some really good self-awareness. Some really good self-perception. That's what's going on in verse 13. Oh, if Satan came at me with all of his temptations, with the onslaught of everything he knows about me and he dumps all that in my, I don't, I don't know if I could stand firm. I know God has made his provision. I know I could, but I know I'm also weak. The spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. And so I'm crying out to the God of the universe, my father in heaven who knows me intimately and I'm asking him to steer me away from this and to actually rescue me and snatch me and save me from the evil one. Psalm 91.3 says, for it is he, God, who delivers you from the snare of the trapper. From the snare of the trapper. And that is where the prayer ends. The rest of your translation should be in brackets because it wasn't part of the original. Our traditional ending to the Lord's Prayer is in later manuscripts, not in the best and the earliest manuscripts. It was added by a scribe somewhere down the road, maybe late in the first century, maybe into the second century. Maybe this was the best summary that the early church had come up with to end this prayer. Now, it's not all bad because I guess if you're gonna to add to the Bible, use the Bible. <laughs> He's pulling from 1 Chronicles 29, 11. So is it wrong to say this last phrase that is uh, there at the end, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever? No, it's not wrong. You can make that part of your personal prayer just, like, just as you can pray from the heart any, any prayers you desire. It comes from the Bible. It's true. It's accurate. It's It's good but it just wasn't part of the original. Just keep that in mind. So Jesus, we ask you, how do we pray? He says, with biblical brevity to an audience of one. So the question comes up, can we recite this prayer? And my answer is yes. If you do it from the heart, if you do it thoughtfully, right? If you do it with faith, if you do it mindful of the words you're saying, and then certainly, yes, you can recite this prayer. You can memorize it. You can teach it to your children. You can pray it. It's no really different than the songs that we would sing at that level, right? It's, we sing songs that should come from the heart. We should mean it. We should, we should be thinking about the lyrics. So, yes, think about the words. But there's a yet better way, you know? I, I show you a better way than reciting it. And it is to let this prayer launch you into its four categories. And I want to spell those out for you as we just kind of begin to wrap up here. We're almost done. This prayer has four categories and it's here as a pattern, it's here as a model, so it's going to launch us into these categories. And I want you to picture it this way. It's like a hallway with four rooms. And you're going to go into one room and enjoy that room for a while. And you're going to pray in that room for a, a good season. And then you come out of that room and you go into the next room and the next room and the next room. And that is a, a great pattern for prayer. Here's room number one. Category number one is worship in anticipation of the return of Christ and his kingdom come. 
So we begin with worship and adoration of God. And, and more specifically, not just generic worship, but God, I'm worshiping you and I'm pleading with you to send your son. He is my king. I want his name vindicated. And let that just fuel the beginnings of your prayer. And you go into that room and you can spend all manner of time in that room enjoying what's in that room. Right? You can spend an hour there and it not be meaningless repetition as you think through all the implications of the return of Christ and his kingdom come. Second category, use your prayer time to express your dependence on God for every need of your life. You and I need to express this. God doesn't need to hear it. We're not informing him, but we need to know it and we need to be reminded. I am not self-made. I am not self-sustained. I depend on God for what? Everything, everything. And so we need to express that. That's the second category. You go into that room and you, and you just kind of lay down there for a while and you meditate and you, and you marvel at how dependent you are on God. Third room is confession of sin. That's why I read 1 John 1 this morning. Confession of sin is a category of prayer and it needs to be a regular part of our prayers. Right. It needs to be a regular part of, uh, we agree with you, God. I agree with you. That was sin. That was wrong. And we say that back to God. And then fourthly, the fourth category is crying out for rescue from a hungry devil. Crying out for rescue from a hungry devil. Now, as believers, we have been rescued. We've been transferred from his grip, but he is still oppressing. He is still attacking. He is still coming after us. He's still snarling. He's still hungry. He wants us back. He can't have us back, <laughs> but he can certainly diminish our witness. And so we cry out that God would rescue us from him. If you want meaningful prayer, this is how to have it. Use these categories. Worship, dependence, confession, crying out. Pray from the heart. Pray in faith. This is meaningful prayer. This is biblical brevity. Okay, so we must then ask one last question. Why is verses 14 and 15 here? It's kind of the PS on the prayer. It's the PS on the sermon. Look at verses 14 and 15. Why is this here? For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. He's your heavenly Father, so I'm already in right relationship with him. This is not about establishing my relationship with God. This is not about justification. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. So Jesus takes one line of the prayer and he gives commentary on it, he gives a PS on it. Why is this here? This is here not for you to establish your relationship with God, but for you to maintain your family fellowship with God. This is not about establishing, this is about maintaining something. I exercise almost on a daily basis. Some days I don't have a lot of energy. I'm 54 years old. Why am I exercising? I'm not trying to create anything. <laughs> I'm not trying to gain anything. I'm just trying to what? Maintain. <laughs> I just don't want to go backwards. That's what verses 14 and 15 is to our spiritual life. I'm not creating my spiritual life. I'm simply trying to maintain my fellowship with God and with God's people. And that comes through this means, you see. This is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. That's what's going on here in verses 14 and 15. This is an oil change for your spiritual life. When you go get your oil change, your car, you're not increasing the speed of that car. You're, it's not going to drive any different than when you pull out than when you pulled in. You're just maintaining the engine. That's what this is doing. This is maintaining the engine of your spiritual life. This is how critical this is then to our spiritual life and fellowship with God. One person said, it is impossible for one to be in fellowship with God as long as he harbors ill will in his heart. If there is anger, if there is bitterness, if there is unforgiveness, if I'm not willing to forgive someone who has wronged me, even wronged me deeply, then I am not, listen, I am not going to experience God's forgiveness of me. I didn't say you're not going to be forgiven. I said, you're not going to experience it. You're not going to enjoy it. You're not going to have the kind of fellowship with God and intimacy with God your Father that you would have otherwise. 
Bitterness wrecks our experience of forgiveness. It wrecks our intimacy with God. It paralyzes our spiritual life. It puts us at a stopping point. And so I would say to you this morning, if your intimacy with God has been derailed, okay? You listening? If your intimacy with God has been derailed, start here. Start here, verses 14 and 15. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the clarity of your word. Thank you for the preciseness, conciseness, and its instruction. I pray today that each of your disciples here would drink this in and learn from it. Teach us how to pray, Lord.